Welcome to Longmont Voices and Vision, a project of Longmont Public Media. In the midst of the darkest period in our lives, when we're bombarded 24 hours a day with news of the coronavirus and the human and economic carnage it's causing in our society, we're challenged to cope with our fears and anxieties while remaining hopeful about what lies on the other side of this crisis. This project presents an opportunity for Longmont residents to share with others how they're adjusting to new realities of social distancing and the kind of future they hope to experience on the other side of the crisis. I'm Tim Waters, host of these conversations and a Longmont Public Media volunteer. In this series, I'll be asking Longmont residents, many of them your friends and neighbors, three questions. What are you doing to get through this crisis? Even though we cannot be together right now, how are we staying connected to friends and families? And what's the future you are hoping to see and experience on the other side of this crisis? I hope you'll stay with this series and enjoy listening to your friends and neighbors and learn from them how they're getting through and what they're looking forward to in a new reality on the other side. Grant Gaddis, thank you for your willingness to spend time with me in this interview and be a contributor to the Longmont Voices and Vision Project. Each of these interviews has uh, begun by learning a little bit about the person being interviewed. So tell us about Grant Gaddis. Yeah, well, I'm Grant. I'm 15 years old and I'm a freshman at Silver Creek High School. Um, one of my favorite things to do is play soccer and also play a little bit of basketball. Um, favorite subjects? Uh, you like I like math. math. I like math. All right, there you go. Uh, Grant, you know that um, I'm going to ask you three questions, and the first of these three questions uh, really is about how you're going to how you're getting through this period of time where none of us have ever experienced this. We've never had to make the kind of adjustments that we're making to where we are right now with stay-at-home orders or safe-at-home orders and quarantines and those kinds. Of so tell us how how is Grant Gaddis getting through this period of all these unknowns? Yeah, I'm just kind of figuring it out as I go. Um, Try and do as many things as I can in a day. I have schoolwork and um, soccer meetings with my soccer team. I'm trying to work out a lot, um, baking, trying new things, lots of Netflix. So I guess I'm just mainly trying to trying to live a normal life like I did before and just trying not to focus on everything. Did I hear you say you're baking? Yes. I was, was baking part of normal life before? A little bit. I like cooking and baking and cool. Yeah, it's been fun. All right. Um, second question, uh, in this time of physical separation and social distancing, uh, in a time when we can't be together, we still want to stay connected with one another. How are you doing that? How are you staying connected to family and friends? Well, for my friends, one of the main ways I'm staying connected with them is just uh, through video games. So on my Xbox, I can get in a party with them. And we can get on a, on a call and talk to each other as we play. And then also um, on the soccer meetings, I get to see a lot of my friends and check in with them. And then as far as family goes, we've been doing a lot of Zoom meetings. Uh, the NFL draft was this last week. And so we all got in a big Zoom meeting and just hung out and talked while the draft was going on, which was fun. All right. You know, my third question yes. uh, is, the, the underlying presumption is that whatever was normal for us before we experienced this pandemic, the new normal is going to be different. Life won't be quite the same. We just don't know what it's going to be like. We don't know what the new normal is going to be. So right now, the question is, what would you like it to be? What would you, what's your preferred future? What would you like to see? And what are you willing to help create on the other side of this pandemic? Well, this quarantine for me has been pretty low stress. It's been pretty slow. And I know for a lot of people, it's been stressful and hectic. But at least for me, it's, it's been pretty nice just to be able to relax. And so I would want the new normal to be, I don't know, probably just like a slower pace of life, 
just to be able to enjoy it more. And um, yeah, I mean, I know for a lot of people, it's not been that way, this quarantine. Uh, but some of the aspects have definitely taken away a lot of my stressors, which has been a big, a big thing in my life. And so, I mean, that's just been, been nice. So um, the aspiration is for a little different pace uh, as we move into the future. Yeah. Um, that, that's a that's part of a future I think we could all resonate with and move toward. Grant, uh, thanks again for uh, taking some time this morning to spend with me and your contribution to this project. Stay safe, take care of yourself, um, and, and, and be part of that uh, family unit that takes care of one another. Thank you. Talk to you later. Bye. Karen McCormick, thank you for your contributions to this Longmont Voices and Vision project, uh, and your many other contributions to this community and to society in general. And I, I hope you'll share some of those when I ask you to talk a little bit about yourself, which I'm gonna do right now. Tell us who Karen McCormick is, what you do. Thank you, Tim. I really appreciate being part of this project and look forward to listening to many of the others that you have interviewed. So I have lived in Longmont for 25 years in the same house, in the same neighborhood. Uh, how I got here, uh, I grew up, uh, I was actually born into a service family. So I was born on a US Naval Air Station where my dad was a fighter pilot in Maryland and then proceeded to be a Navy brat, moving all over the country throughout school uh, where my dad was serving a total of 30 years in the Navy. And so that really has framed a big part of who I am and how I see my country and my community and kind of my civic uh, responsibility to others and it kind of comes from that i really do think it's in my dna i went on to uh, go into a service profession so i went to veterinary school and became a small animal veterinarian and practiced that field for 33 years with uh, about half of that time running my own small business here in boulder county with um, a practice that grew from a two doctor practice to five doctors, 25 employees. It was a, I never intended to be a business owner, actually. It just kind of evolved into that. I was perfectly content to be an employee for about half of my, my veterinary career uh, until I saw that there were better ways to do things than the, my employees were, my employers were doing. And one thing led to another and um, I, my really good friend, best friend, and I bought a practice um, and, and grew it. And it was an amazing experience and I loved it. And I loved serving my community and I actually just loved solving problems. And so medicine was a perfect field for me to be in, to, to do that, to serve my public and to fix things. I, I think I got that from my dad as well. He was a mechanical engineer and he just fixed everything in our house. And so, uh, so being here in Longmont all that time, we, my husband and I raised three kids right here and they all went to public school in the St. Frank Valley school system. Uh, and that was a wonderful experience. Uh, you know, I talk about veterinary medicine, but being a mom is actually the most fulfilling thing I've ever done. The best job anyone could ever had, have. And it's a, it's a learn on the job training, you know, it's on the job training that <laughs> you're not necessarily prepared for. Uh, but being a lifelong learner, I was always the one that would go find out how, how do I do this with my kids or how do I address this issue? Uh, and that's how I face pretty much everything. If I don't know, I'm, I'm willing to say, I don't know and go find out. And so after my veterinary career, uh, we had an election here in 2016 nationwide that really uh, knocked me off my feet and uh, created kind of a new sense of purpose in me to uh, serve my community in a new way. And I made the crazy, insane decision to run for Congress from, uh, from never having run for anything, never having held any kind of public office from city council to the school board, I, you know, I just went big. And uh, looking back, it seems, it does seem kind of crazy, but I was so driven to get 
a better voice for the people of our district here in Colorado, the fourth congressional. And I didn't feel like our representative was, was doing his job at all, uh, because I feel that the job of a representative is to listen first and then to help the people of your community. And I don't think he was doing either one of those things. So <laughs> that, that was my last, my most recent uh, experience. And uh, I, I got to know a lot of people that I didn't know in Longmont. I, you know, I've spent these 25 years raising kids and, and running a business and kind of just in my zone of doing what you do when you're kind of in your working years. And so the last few years has allowed me to meet a lot of people in my community and across the state that I never would have met. I never would have learned the things I learned if I hadn't done that. So I'm really glad I did. And uh, then after that experience, I just kind of reflected back on it and saw that there was another opportunity um, on the horizon, and that is to be a state representative at the state assembly because our present representative is term limited. And this actually feels like a much better fit for me to run for this office and to know that I have um, community support that I had built. Um, so I'm excited about this race and this opportunity. And that kind of brings us to, to today. And uh, now that we've all been thrown this huge uh, a challenge actually dealing with this global pandemic and how do we navigate ourselves through it and there's just every single person on the planet has been affected by this and in a multitude of ways so it's it's really interesting to continue to read and hear about what's what's happening out there well so one here of the, i am there we go <laughs> we've all it's the first time in any of our lives that we've all Globally, everyone is experiencing that same thing at the same time. I mean, it just has never happened quite this way. Right. Well, you learned a lot from others. Now we want to learn a little bit from you. Uh, you know, I'm going to ask three questions. And the first of those, given, uh, given what this means in terms of unknowns and uncertainties and the, uh, the challenges to get through this, uh, how are you getting yourself through this unique period in history? Well, uh, I, I mentioned that uh, I have three kids and a month, five weeks ago, all three of them were in Manhattan. So New York <laughs> is kind of the uh, epicenter of our U.S. Uh, pandemic uh, threat. And I, as a mom, was uh, getting super anxious about having them in that city and um, at the time they were continuing to work. They all had jobs and little by little, uh, some of the uh, people started working remotely. One daughter, her job uh, went remote. Um, the other two, one was working in a coffee shop, the other in, for the teachers union, um, the attorneys for the teacher union downtown near Wall Street. And I was talking to them uh, regularly and hearing the anxiety that they were facing. And so that was my biggest focus for a while is to get them the heck out of there because we had the ability to do so. And there were, they already had a car. One of my kids had a car there. And so we just worked hard to, to make that happen. Uh, they drove home, uh, you know, two long days. I found them a hotel room in Illinois and got them home and so two have been able to continue their jobs remotely one of them lost their job because the coffee shop has closed and they are in the artistic uh, community as well so all the arts and music and all of that is just shut down so that kid is really just here uh, existing um, so that was a big hurdle for me personally to get over and to get them here where I knew that um, I could see them. And they were under quarantine inside our house for two weeks um, before I could even hug them, which was a big deal. So the day they were able to take off their masks and, and be on the same living space that Greg and I um, are on was huge for me. Um, being mostly an introvert introvert this this whole experience is not that hard on me personally as far as my spiritual self my inner 
being. Uh, I find that it's a great, it's almost a gift of time to be able to reflect on, on we, you know, we talked about how the whole world, every single person in the world is affected by this, um, but this isn't the only thing or the first thing. I, I go immediately to our, our earth and our climate and our atmosphere and our, all the, the air that we're all breathing. Um, we're all affected by that. Um, that also has no boundaries and no borders. And so it, it, it allows me to think, even though we're all separated and um, isolated, we're all in this together. And how else are we all in something together? So, and on a daily basis, we just kind of have our routine where we walk more, I read more, I train this puppy. <laughs> Um, we make lists for the grocery store and I send Greg to the grocery store uh, with a list and he comes home with whatever they have. <laughs> so that's interesting and new. And um, we are just trying to get to know each other again as a family unit with three adult kids in the house. And um, it's where we're, I'm eating way too much. <laughs> because you're home and you just go open the refrigerator and look at it and <laughs> close it. But uh, I, I'm getting through and I really appreciate, I'm learning all about Zoom and how, um, you know, how exhausting that can be sometimes too. So uh, I, I know we're going to get through this. I do see the end, um, just don't know exactly when it is. So I, I'm appreciating the process, actually. I'm not frustrated with it. Karen, you mentioned Zoom. You have your, your daughters there with you. Uh, uh, so being connected to your, your immediate family, nuclear family, is, is not so challenging. But being connected to friends and, and given your aspirations in life, uh, connecting with a lot of folks is, is a need. So how, how are you staying connected to those members of your family who are not in your home? I know your mother is, is close by. Um, yeah. And then friends and the others who, with whom you want to network. How, what's the, how are you doing that in this time of separation? Yeah, so there are more phone calls happening, just good old-fashioned phone calls uh, with my two brothers who uh, don't connect very well. One lives in Golden and one is on the East Coast in Annapolis. So I've actually spoken with them more than I usually do, which is kind of nice. My mom, um, I'm being I'm being the mom to, to my mom, and uh, we are getting her groceries for her and delivering them uh, to her doorstep. I ring the doorbell and I step back ten feet. I have not been in my mom's house for six weeks. I think it was six weeks ago we went out to lunch together to Pinocchio's, and that's the last time I was ever that close to her. Uh, she's 87. I absolutely do not want her to get this virus. Uh, so I told her, you're going to live in your house till we have a vaccine. And she goes to her mailbox and she walks around the block and she's learned how to use Zoom. So that's pretty amazing. And uh, the having Zoom and other technologies like that has been great. We have our weekly rotary meeting where 90 people get on there <laughs> and that's kind of fun and uh, my local gym um, has gone to doing their uh, workouts on zoom so you can see everybody and hear, hear everybody I did that this morning um, and in some ways it's more convenient because you don't have to drive across town <laughs> you, you get this so it's kind of interesting that you um, can get things done almost more efficiently. I do miss, though, the reason I said it's kind of exhausting sometimes. I think because of the type of person I am, I miss being with people and drawing that kind of um, social interaction from being in the same room with people. And so this type of technology is, is a nice substitute, but it doesn't fulfill that need to actually be with people. I, I think, in fact, I was talking to one of my kids that we miss out on some of the body language that we read uh, subconsciously from others when we're with them. We, we are focused on a, a different air, you know, we're like 
looking at a screen and we you know, see ourselves over there in the corner, that's distracting. Uh, so there's a whole other level of communication that's happening that we're not used to. And, and I think that's the part that's it's kind of tiring for me. But um, I like good old fashioned phone calls. <laughs> so, so we're doing that. Yeah, uh, in these interviews, uh, people have made the observation that this device that's been used for so many things except phone calls now is being used for phone calls, right? We use it for all, everything else but calls. Now we're using it, you know, to right. talk to one another. So, right, right. Uh, you know, my third question is um, really a, a future focused question. Um, based on the presumption, that whatever the new normal be becomes, life's going to be different. Unlike what what it was, we're going to see something that that we don't know what it is. Something new. So, um, what for you would be a preferred future? Assuming there's going to be a new normal, what is the preferred future that you'd like to see and help create? Yes, and I like when you said we don't know what it's going to be. Isn't that a great opportunity? Yeah. We don't know what it's going to be. It's, it's like, here's our chance. Here's our chance to dream big. And I believe truly that the first step to um, manifesting something is to visualize it. And so if we, and this is why it's important for me to go, I want to go listen to what everybody else had to say. You know, what if we had a world where we all truly cared about each other and, and our earth, truly cared about our earth? And we all, what if we had a world where there was clean air and clean water um, and enough food for everybody? And what if we had a world where everyone had a safe place to sleep and um, everyone had access to a good education no matter where they live so i you know i think about these big things and we had the ability for everybody to have the health care their health care needs met and they weren't holding back because they couldn't get somewhere or couldn't afford it and if every young, i think of my kids if every young person could reach their full potential no matter no matter where they're starting and um, and if we use our dialogue and our connectedness with other humans to, to address conflict and to solve problems. So I, I think of those types of things like this is the world I want and I don't think any of these things are, I think almost every single person could agree with every single one of those things that how do we do it and how do we dream big and take the steps towards that vision and i want to be part of that and i want to do it right here in colorado to start and um my my big focus is on our earth i think it is the umbrella that that everything else falls under and it's our responsibility right now we can do it right now we have the answers let's do it Karen McCormick, that is a future uh, worth aspiring for and moving toward. So thanks for sharing your aspirations. Thanks for all you do in this community and thanks for your contribution to this project. Be safe, take care of yourself and, and your beautiful family. Thank you. Kimberly Braun, thank you for your willingness to contribute to the Lama Voices and Vision Project. Thank you as well for the many other contributions you make to the community. So uh, each of these interviews starts with learning something about the person being interviewed. So tell us about you, who you are, what you do, and then we'll pick up questions after that. Thanks so much, Tim, for having me. I feel blessed to be with you. And I am the Director of Development at HOPE Homeless Outreach and Providing Encouragement. I stepped on full time as the director the very day that COVID hit. And what's very interesting about that, I don't think there are coincidences, is that uh, long range, I'm actually a minister, um, a speaker, I've traveled the world teaching and helping humanity realize 
their inner gifts and their potential and develop their spirituality. And I had been longing to be part of my local community more. And I have a lot of success on being a providential part of wonderful projects that built up community in the past. And it was no, it was no surprise when this opportunity came across my path completely pre-COVID and it was the right way to step in. So I feel incredibly fortunate to go from a global way of being of service to a very local way. Sounds like if, uh, if conditions make the person or make the opportunity, you were the right person at the right time for this opportunity. So Kimberly, you know, I'm gonna ask you three questions. Uh, and the first question is this, uh, we're at a point in time where that none of us have a period in history that none of us have ever experienced. Uh, and there probably have been times in human history where people were as separated as we are now, but, but nothing in our lifetimes. Uh, and there's a, all the unknowns and the anxieties that go along with what we're dealing with with this pande pandemic. Everybody has to figure out how to get through it. Um, so how are you getting yourself through this period of time. Yeah, thank you. So my life ever since I was five has been impelled from a really strong experience of spirit. And with that, uh, I have assented to life here being all about being and becoming in God, if you will. So at this time in my life, now that I'm older, I'm more in a place of finding within myself a peace and an equanimity that is natural and effortless and that I get to place at the service of those around me. So one of the ways that I'm doing to get through it is to allow the gifts and the skillfulness that I've been fortunate to develop be at the service actively whether it's the way I might look at somebody if we're passing each other six feet apart, whether it's in my role at Hope, whether it's through a workshop that I get to teach. And there's always a reciprocity that what we give, we receive. So I feel that my own, my own sense of certainty that we're coming through it and clear vision is amplified by the way I'm of service to help others find peace and stability. Well, as you work yourself through this, uh, we're also physically separated from one another, socially distanced from one another. In a time where we can't be together physically, we still need to stay connected with one another. So how are you doing that? How are you staying connected to family and friends? Uh, that's a great one, because by the way, Tim, I am a hugger. Like, I am so touchy-feely. This is really hard. Oh. To <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I practice a lot of contemplative practice. And so it's very easy for me to be in the presence of those I love, even if physically I can't go over to their homes. So I'm blessed, and I practice that actively. That being said, and I was a Carmelite nun for many years, so living in a monastery, I think, has is serving me well right now. Uh, in addition to that, probably like many have already said, I am using a lot of Zoom. <laughs> I have attended dance parties, birthday parties, dinner parties, happy hours. I just moved into a new home and my way of sharing it is to FaceTime or WhatsApp with people and walk them through my home, like get a glass of champagne. And then I walk them through my home. So a lot of the online technology is serving me really well. Uh, well it's certainly things that we've heard through many of these interviews uh, that the technology, today's technologies uh, help at least overcome some of the that distance that we're experiencing. Yes. We also know that my third question uh, is, is based on the presumption that uh, there will be an end to this, that we'll come out of the stay at home orders or the safe at home orders and, and all of the, the separation we're, ex we're experiencing and we'll settle into some kind of new normal. The presumption is that whatever life is, whatever the new normal is, life is gonna be different than it was before the pandemic. So with that thought in mind, my question for you is, what would you like to see in that new normal? What's your preferred future 
-hmm. that you'd both like to see and help create on the other side of this pandemic? I love that. I would uh, love for there to be a pervading simplicity in, in all layers of society, uh, a simplicity that has allowed what is irrelevant to fall away. I, I work with so many people who have said they're running the rat race or they're on the, the whatever the wheel is that goes around and around and or they suffer anxiety or depression or worry and here is a chance i would never minimize the hardship that is that's happening and could happen in the future but looking on the positive side there is a chance for there to be a reset button and to let fall away the real irrelevant things when it comes to our occupations our relationships what we consider it to be a successful life. And in that is a resulting simplicity. So on an interpersonal level, I would like to see that a, a coming together in community with a clarity of why we're alive and that we're alive. And then on a socioeconomic level, I would love to see a principle that I learned in seminary put into place. And theologically speaking, if if we're living up our, to our potential in humanity, there's an, an ethical principle called the principle of subsidiarity. And that principle says that all the power is kept in the lowest hands possible. For like, I don't like hierarchies, but for lack of a better phrase, which means that society itself could be reorganized so that it's not so trickle down and there are not small numbers of people making all the decisions for the larger people, but rather we have the larger bodies experience, wisdom, and uh, opinions being valued to create the community that we live in. And with the shakeup on all levels, there is a chance that we could step into living that principle out, which is honors the dignity of each human being more effectively. Kimberly, if there's ever a moment in anyone's history where that opportunity is out there, I think it's now. Uh, so thank you for sharing your preferred future. Thanks for your contribution to the Voices and Vision Project. And more importantly, thanks for the day-to-day, uh, -day, day in and day out, night in and night out, contribution you're making to Longmont and some of our most vulnerable residents. Thank you. Take care of yourself, stay safe and healthy. And when we can come out from the stay at home orders, uh, maybe we'll see each other and we can give one another hug. I will look forward to <laughs> that. <laughs> Take care of yourself. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Tom and Marion Stumpf, thank you so much for your willingness to contribute to the Longmont Voices and Vision Project. Uh, we appreciate your contributions to this and your many other contributions to this community. So tell us a little bit about the, all these interviews have started with learning about the interviewee. So tell us about you, who you are, and, and what your life has been in Longmont. And then we'll get into these questions that I'm going to ask. Okay, well, we uh, were fortunate enough to uh, come to Longmont in 1984 when I accept the, accepted the principalship of Niwot High School. And I was there for a number of years and then transferred over to Skyline High School and was there for 20 years. And right before I retired, uh, Dr. Haddad said, uh, hey, how would you like to uh, get Mead High School started and bring it all into existence after all the building is up? And uh, I said, yeah, that sounds great. I'll do that. So. I've had uh, 25 years of uh, working in secondary high school administration here in the district. And I must say it's been a great journey. I retired in 2009 and have enjoyed retirement very much. So Mary? And we, we moved here, as Tom said, in 1984 with a three, a five, and a seven-year-old. and. Um, they have now grown to very successful adults who have uh, successful careers and 
uh, during that time, um, I played a role of mother. I was on several boards here. I was on the board of directors for the original Boulder County Hospice. Um, then I got a brainstorm to go back to school and start a third career. I was an educator and a social worker, and I went back and got a doctorate in nursing. And then I spent that career, probably 15 plus years, working with underserved elderly in uh, the Denver area. Um, so it's been a wonderful ride here. We love this community. We don't have plans to leave it. And um, it's, we have been very successful and very happy. Well, thanks, thanks for all those questions. We, uh, as a career educator, we all know who our first responders are, right? That's right. Moms, dads, and teachers and principals. So, yeah, right, right, yeah. right. Um, well, the first of my three questions is this: um, We're in a period of time where uh, that, that none of us have ever experienced. Uh, there's a lot of of uh, unknowns and uncertainties that we're living with right now. So given those, the unknowns, how are you getting yourselves through this period of, of uncertainty and it's such an extraordinary uh, moment in time? Well, I think one of the things that suddenly struck me was, and because we're retired, that this is a time when you begin to think about what projects you haven't done. <laughs> I began to make a list. It's always been in my head, but I actually wrote it down. It and isn't a bucket list, it's a honey <laughs> list. <laughs> Not true. I get it, I get it. Some of them are relating to both of us, but it's a time when it's like, you know, we will run out of time at some point, and it's a time to sort of take, um, take stock of where you are and what you want to do and so forth. So I wrote my list down and um, I began to do some of the projects. What I realized is that it's easy even in this period to put those projects off. So it has to be very, you know, um, you have to sort of think about it and do it and sort of check it off. My husband's a great list maker, but I actually made a list and I have crossed off a few of those things. So it's a time to, I think, reflect um, to get some projects done that you might have been putting off for a long time. Um, I'm an avid reader, so I do a lot of reading. We watch very little TV. Um, we're both gourmet cooks. We love to cook, so it's a good time to begin to cook some of those thousands of recipes that you haven't had a chance to do um, and actually share them, some of the things with some friends, some baked goods that I've made. Uh, and I told them they're all sanitized so they don't have to worry. So that's pretty much what I have thought about doing or what, what's pulling me through this time and staying connected to friends, which I have done always, but again, on a more intense level. Okay, I, I certainly reflect that, Tim. Uh, and uh, I understand the uh, honeydew list very definitely. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, I find the time, uh, kind of peaceful in a way, because it's less frenetic. Uh, you're not running around doing things uh, that you have some responsibility for even in retirement. And uh, like Marion said, we like to cook. Uh, we like to, to share our goodies, that sort of thing. So that's always been, a, a, has been a diversion during this time. Uh, but it, it's a it's a time for introspection, I think, and kind of figure out where you've been with your life and where you want to go with uh, what lies ahead. Uh, I kind of like to call it a hyper retirement uh, this <laughs> period of time. So since it is retirement, I not only like to do reading, but I enjoy an occasional afternoon nap. <laughs> 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 They're probably way more naps being taken these days <laughs> than ever. So yeah, you're right. Yeah. It's so texture on your part. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the the physical separation and social distancing um, has created a, a an, an environment where we don't get to connect in, with people, the ones we love and the ones we would spend time with um, as friends and neighbors, like we have historically or and you know, what we're accustomed to. Uh, but it doesn't mean that we don't want to stay connected. So with those kids you were talking about having raised and, and your extended family and your, and your friends, how are you staying connected as we go through this time of social distancing and 
physical isolation. Well, I have always been, this is not just in this time, I've always been a great letter writer. I believe it's a lost art. And um, I have made a conscious effort to maybe be more conscious of that and send an occasional note to somebody that might not get mail that day. Um, and that I think has been very important to me. Um, I also, we have connected with our children. Um, two of them are in the Pacific Northwest. So we have connected with FaceTime and Zoom um, and our grandchildren uh, because they're home from school, they're four and eight, they have figured out how to connect with us kind of on their own. So we frequently will get a call, especially from our eight-year-old granddaughter who wants to chat for about an hour. So um, she's become very creative on, on instant message kids, I think it is. And she's had a lot of fun with talking to Papa and Grandma Marion. And it's been delightful to see those kids and to have that chance to do that. So that, so, and phone calls have been really important too, even, to, not just pictures talking on Facebook, but, but phone calls. Yeah, Marion's uh, really good about uh, phone calls and keeping in touch with people a lot better than I am. Uh, but I figure she's my better half anyway, so <laughs> she, can care, she can take care of those uh, obligations or responsibilities. But uh, you're right about, she's right about the uh, connectivity that we have. Uh, since we've got all this technology and, and uh, our grandkids really have taught us a lot about what, how to, how to deal with like the video chats and FaceTime and all of that. <laughs> and uh, I find that very refreshing uh, during the day to be able to hook up with the grandkids, an eight-year-old granddaughter and a four-year-old grandson, soon to be five. So they're a lot of fun and they're lively and uh, that's basically how I stay in touch, mostly through Marion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know, the third question I'm asking you is really a future focused question. Um, and it's, it's, it's based on this presumption that whatever was normal before the pandemic, there'll be a new normal. And we don't know what it's gonna be. Uh, but, but life won't be the same as it was just exactly before the pandemic. So the question for you is, what would you like to see in that, in that new normal? What's your preferred future that you'd like to move toward and help create? I think that for me, I've always been very sensitive, probably because the nursing, the educator, the social worker, um, I've been very sensitive to people's needs. And um, I am hoping that because we have had time to focus and be aware of how important it is to be sensitive to other people's needs. And um, I think we take a lot of that for granted. Um, I remember hearing or reading on, on the Longmont website of some woman who said she was uh, walking and was saying hello to her neighbor and she was at least 10 feet away and the neighbor didn't respond and kind of looked at her scowling and um, I think we need to be really sensitive to the needs of others and I'm hoping that we will become more aware of that. Um, I also am very hopeful that there will be a political change um, because I think right now we are in a very serious political crisis and um, I'm hoping that that will be something we can look forward to and sort of just re redo our whole persona as a nation, as a community, um, as, and as individual people. Huh? Marion's always very articulate, as you can <laughs> tell. Anyway, um, I guess I, I feel very strongly, Tim, and, and you may have experienced a little bit of this uh, at city council meetings when I've made presentations during the public forum, but uh, I feel very strongly that the earth doesn't belong to us. We belong to the earth. And what we're experiencing right now, this pandemic of COVID-19, is really a microcosm of what lies ahead. 
And I think it's kind of like a prologue to that uh, existential threat that Stephen Hawking was talking about in 2016, when he said, this is the, the, the climate change is the most existential threat to human species ever. And that was only four years ago. And I think that just as the, the COVID-19 is impacting the human species, so too in a more profound way, will climate change be in, impacting us? Oh sure, it's kind of in the distant future and it probably won't impact us, uh, but it's nonetheless as profound and as severe. And so what I'm hoping for and what I'm uh, have been working toward in a very maybe insig <clears throat> insignificant way is trying to uh, increase an awareness of the devastation that our common home is going to be experiencing down the road. And if we don't get to 2030 without reducing emissions, and it's very interesting because how the air has already changed because of the lack of traffic, just to make it real simple, uh, unless we get there, we're going to suffer with all those emissions and VOCs and all that stuff in the, in the atmosphere. We're experiencing that. And, and I, I'm firmly convinced that uh, we need to take that as serious, if not more seriously, than we do COVID-19. It sounds to me, Tom, like um, the preferred future is that this is a wake-up call for that we start paying attention to uh, totally. to what 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 awaits us if if we're not paying attention. That's right. And uh, Mary, it sounds it's, it sums it up better than I did. So. Well, no, I'm not. Listen, this is your story, not mine, and I and I appreciate your. But and Mary, it sounds to me like um, hanging together, right? Being connected to one another as we go forward has right. to be part of that as well. People. It's wonderful seeing families walking out together, walking their dogs, and I'm hoping that that continues. Um, I, you know, I think there are a lot of people that maybe went out to eat four times a week when they realized, well, maybe we don't need to go out to eat four times a week. Maybe we can cook at home and enjoy each other and sit around the table and have a meal. So I'm hoping, again, that that will be more center-focused on our own families and how we can care for one another. You know, I've heard in these re in these interviews that uh, some people have have commented on gaining weight uh, because <laughs> because they have more proximity to the refrigerator, it, but dogs are losing weight because they're being walked a lot more. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> they're kind of hoping we get back to where we <laughs> so walk so much. Uh, thank you both for your uh, contrib your your contributions to this project, for your contributions to the community. Uh, take care of yourself, stay safe, and and take care of your family. Well, Thank that's you. reciprocal, Tim. You've done Thank a great you. job bringing this all together, and, and I salute you for that. That's uh, quite a commitment. All right. Well, when we're when we're able to reemerge from our our stay at home or safe at home orders, uh, our paths will cross in in all kinds of settings, and we'll keep learning our way forward together. Thank Thanks. you very much. Thank Thanks, you. Tim. Have Take a care. great day. You Bye -bye. too.